Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for joining me today as we study the book of 2 Kings, chapters 17 through 25, finishing up that book. And my goal with this channel is to not only give you insight into the scriptures, but also provide you with methods and materials that can help you to teach those insights to other people in relevant and meaningful ways. So, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Now, for an icebreaker, I'd like to talk about maps. And just for fun, I might display a few examples of some funny maps that that I found, uh, just as an attention getter. And here are a few that I found amusing. So there's this one. And this one. And this. And this. <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm somebody who has always been fascinated by maps. I just love maps. There's just something oddly satisfying and inherently interesting about a well-made map. It gives you perspective. It gives you confidence in travel. It gives you comfort in a way. Maps clarify the unknown and allow you to plan your pathway through any landscape. Now, maps can teach you more than just how to get from point A to point B. And I found in my years of teaching that maps can teach gospel principles as well. Now, there's a map in the back of your church-produced version of the scriptures that contains a fascinating principle in it. It's map number five. And this map is going to be the focus of our study here. At first glance, it might not look like much. Uh, Why should I care about the borders of the Assyrian Empire between 721 BC and 650 BC, you might ask? Well, I think you should care. The principle this map teaches may very well hold a key to our exaltation. Now, what do you notice as you look at that map? For one, you're going to notice that the Assyrian Empire greatly increases in size between those two dates. And that's because the Assyrians during that time are able to conquer a majority of the ancient world. Everything from Mesopotamia in the east to Turkey in the north and all the way into Egypt in the south. But look really closely. What else do you notice about that map? Now look look at this right here. Do you, do you see this tiny little circle or dotted borderline surrounding the city of Jerusalem? It's labeled as the kingdom of Judah. And that's interesting. The Assyrians were able to conquer basically everything else in the ancient world, but not that one city, that one little area. Why is that? That's the money question today. And there are two men's names that you really need to know in order to understand that border. They're Isaiah and Hezekiah. Isaiah is the prophet at this time, and Hezekiah is the king of Judah. Now, I'm sure that you've all heard of Isaiah before, and we're going to be studying his book in depth later this year. But have you ever heard of King Hezekiah? He's just not as well-known a personality in the Old Testament, but I think he should be. He's one of the greatest kings of all time. And I want to help you to understand why Hezekiah was considered to be such a great king. You really need some context to, to comprehend his greatness. You may remember a few weeks ago that we discussed the splitting of the Israelite nation. No longer do we have one kingdom united under a single king, but two the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom of Judah. And that split came under Solomon's son, Rehoboam. The northern tribes, ten of them, rebelled against Rehoboam, and they choose a man named Jeroboam to be their king. Now we have two kings to keep track of at a time. I don't want to spend too much time getting bogged down in the history, 
but perhaps this chart can help give you a better overview and perspective of the Old Testament timeline here. And I'll make this chart available as a handout if you're interested. And what it shows is a list and the order of all the kings of both the Israelite and Judean kingdoms. And then you'll see that there's another column that shows all the different prophets that are going to be called during these times. You may also notice that one kingdom column is shorter than the other. And that's because the kingdom of Israel isn't going to last as long as the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Israel is going to be conquered and scattered by the Assyrians right around the same time in 2 Kings when Hezekiah is the king of Judah. And that's how they're going to become known as the lost ten tribes of Israel. The kingdom of Judah is going to last a little longer, but eventually it too is going to be conquered, but by the Babylonians. And that takes place at the end of the book of 2 Kings. The people of Judah are going to be scattered, but not forgotten. They're eventually going to return and reestablish themselves in Israel and Jerusalem once again. We'll talk about that next week in Nehemiah and Ezra. But what is the major cause of these kingdoms being destroyed? What is it that led to their demise? In a word, idolatry. You remember at the beginning of this year, another map lesson that we had where we discussed the reason for why God placed the Israelites where he did, right in the center of the ancient world, at the convergence of three continents. It was so that they could influence and bless and spread the gospel message to all the nations around them. But then there was a danger in that too. And the danger was that the influence could work the other way as well. And that's really what happens. That's the Old Testament problem. The Israelites really struggled with being influenced by the pagan religions of the nations around them. Now, there's a term that you're going to see all throughout this portion of Israelite history. And that term is the high places. The high places. And what were these high places? High places were centers of worship for false gods or idolatrous practices. And immorality and child sacrifice were often associated with these places. And we read about high places being set up in both kingdoms, initially under Solomon in 1 Kings 11, 6 through 8, and later Jeroboam I in 1 Kings 12, 28 through 33. But back to our initial question, what made Hezekiah so special? Well, let's see. What was he able to do that so many others could not? And what I'm going to do is give you the name of a king and a scripture reference. And the question for each of these is, did this king remove the high places? So 1 Kings 15, 14. King Asa. Nope, the high places remain. 1 Kings 22, verse 43. Jehoshaphat. Nope, they're still there. In 2 Kings 10, 29, King Jehu. Nope, still there. 2 Kings 12, verse 3, Joash. Nope, they're still there. 2 Kings 14, 4, King Amaziah. High places are still there. 2 Kings 15, 4, Jeroboam II. Still there. 2 Kings 15.35, King Jotham, still there. 2 Kings 16.4, King Ahaz, still there. 2 Kings 17.11, King Hosea, still high places. And 2 Kings 18.4, King Hezekiah. Ah, now there we go. Look at what Hezekiah does here. Let's actually take a look at the first four verses of the chapter. 
Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places, and brake the images, and cut down the groves, and brake in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan. So right off the bat, you can see why I admire Hezekiah so much. Now, Israel really has no righteous kings. But Judah, the kingdom of Judah, has mostly wicked kings, but there are just a few righteous ones. Hezekiah being one, and a king named Josiah that we're going to talk about later. And then there's a whole string of okay kings that weren't necessarily wicked, but they never broke down the high places. They were too intimidated by the people to do that. But Hezekiah does something that no other king before him was really able to do, including his own father. He removes the high places, destroys the false gods, and helps the people return to a true worship of Jehovah in the temple. Now that should help us to set the stage for the rest of our lesson here. Now, here in 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah and his people have a big problem on their hands. And what is it? Perhaps you could just scan verses 8 through 17 for the answer. And what's the big problem? The Assyrians. The Assyrians are conquering everything and everybody. In fact, in verse 11, you can see that this is the point that the kingdom of Israel the northern ten tribes, are conquered and scattered. And now the kingdom of Judah is surrounded and outnumbered. The Assyrians have virtually conquered everybody else. Now Hezekiah does hold them off for a while by paying tribute, but that only lasts for so long. Eventually, the king of Assyria sends an army to lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah and the people decide not to surrender, but to find refuge behind the walls of Jerusalem, their only defense. They just don't have the manpower or the numbers to stand against the Assyrians. So that's our setting. Picture the city of Jerusalem surrounded by countless hosts of Assyrian soldiers. And that's where we want to begin to liken the scriptures. And I help my students to make that transition by asking the following question. How is our situation today similar to the people of Jerusalem? Well, we too are surrounded by the enemy. We too seem to be outnumbered. Faithful disciples of Jesus Christ are few in comparison with the rest of the world. Our values are under siege. Our morality is under siege. Our beliefs are under siege. And who's attacking us? Who are our Assyrians? The influence of the world? Disbelief? Cynicism? Temptation? Sin? Perhaps those who strive to tear down our faith or lure us or our children into addictive and destructive behaviors or doubt? At first glance, our prospects as a people in a church may not look very hopeful or optimistic, just like Hezekiah in Jerusalem. So what's a believer to do? And it's at this point in the story that up to the walls of Jerusalem strolls the captain of the Assyrian army, a man named Rab Shekeh. And he's going to try to convince the people to give up, to surrender, to allow themselves to be captured and conquered. And who would Rob Shekeh be a type of or a symbol for? Who is it that tries to get us to surrender, to give in to their influence? Satan, right? He's the leader of the opposition. 
Now, here's what I'd like you to do in this next section. I want you to look for the parallels between the arguments that Rab Shekeh uses to try and get the people of Jerusalem to surrender and the arguments the adversary and the world uses to try and get us to give up, to give up on our faith and our obedience. I'll give you a set of verses, and you put the worldly argument that you see in your own words. So 19 to 22. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust, that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. Now at this point, the Assyrians haven't conquered Egypt, and Hezekiah is is hoping that the Egyptians will help them. But if ye say unto me, We trust in the Lord our God, Is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem or the temple? Now, what's the argument here? Here's how I would put it. Your faith in God is vain. And Rab Shekeh asks, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Another word for confidence would be faith. Satan has always been and always will be anti-faith. You think you can stand against me, he taunts? You think you're strong enough to resist? Just who do you think you are? Your faith can't save you. Does the world ever use that argument against us? Is faith in an unseen God and power mocked and scoffed at by the world? a belief in miracles, spiritual gifts, angels, gold plates, revelation. These things are always going to seem foolish to the unbelieving. They're going to say, "Uh, it's silly to have confidence or trust or faith in these kinds of things. And then in verses 26 through 28, you have this interesting interchange between the Judean leaders and Rab Shekeh. Rab Shekeh is speaking in Hebrew to them. And so the leaders plead with him to speak in Assyrian. They're worried that the soldiers on the wall or the people in the city might hear his words and be intimidated by them. And and do you think that's going to deter him from his tirade here? No, no, it doesn't work. It just emboldens him. And he scoffs even more at them. He says something rather vulgar to suggest that they're eventually going to starve to death. And he insists on speaking in Hebrew. Now, what's his argument in your own words in verses 29 to 31? Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah. What's the argument? Don't listen to your leaders. They're deceiving you. They're wrong. Hearken not to Hezekiah. Does the world make this argument to us? You bet. Don't listen to those old men in Salt Lake. Don't listen to your local church leaders. They've got ulterior motives. They're just trying to control you. They don't know what they're talking about. They're too old-fashioned, too prudish. They're behind the times. Their teachings won't save you. Hearken not. And what's the main gist of the argument in 31 to 32? For thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree. And drink ye every one the waters of his cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, 
a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Ah, this is such a good one. What's his argument? Give up. Give in. Join us. Your life will be so much better. Do you hear how Rob Shekeh is trying to convince them how much better it will be for them if they just surrender? Make an agreement with me. You'll eat from your own vine, your own fig tree. Yeah, if you give in, everything's going to be okay. I'll treat you well. But in the very next verse, he says, until I come and take you away to another land. It's pretty subtle, pretty deceptive. A land of oil and honey and bread and vineyards. Of course, he's whispering under his breath, you'll be our slaves. We'll control every aspect of your life. But hey, things are going to be okay. We'll feed you. Does Satan do the same thing? Yeah, yeah. He always promises freedom out of one side of his mouth while he hides his chains of sin behind his back. As soon as we surrender and come out from behind our walls, our walls of obedience and faith, he starts to work, wrapping us up in the chains of spiritual bondage, consequence, addiction. The adversary does a very good job of luring and enticing people into surrendering their righteousness. He makes worldly lifestyles and attitudes and opinions look inviting, liberating, progressive. But spiritual slavery and captivity are what lurks behind it all. And finally, what's the argument that you see in verses 33 to 35? Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? In our own words, others have fallen. And so will you. Satan will often try to persuade us to surrender because everyone else is doing it. Or he tries to point to examples of other people who have given up or given in to persuade us to do the same. So and so had faith and look what happened to them. This person fell. You think you're better? I got them and I'll get you too. Intimidation and fear are some of the adversary's greatest weapons. Now, has the adversary ever used any of these arguments against you? Have you ever heard the taunts of today's Rob Shakez in your own life? I'm sure you have. So what can we do about it? Well, let me tell you. We can follow the example of Hezekiah and his people. Contrary to what the Rob Shakez say, we do have some weapons of our own. We have protection and sources of strength that we can turn to in times of attack, in times of challenge. And at this point in the story, I like to do a little object lesson. Years ago, I found this item at a military surplus store, and I bought one. Now, do you know what this is? It's an ammunition box. Soldiers would carry ammunition or bullets in these containers. So when the enemy came to attack them, they could open these boxes and replenish their ammunition. Now, if you have a military surplus store nearby, I can almost guarantee that they're going to have some of these for a small price. And if not, Amazon has some available as well. And I'll put a link in the video description below if you're interested. But then I make the point that Hezekiah and his people had some ammo of their own. There are things that help them to stand strong in the face of the overwhelming power of the Assyrian army. Now, I'm going to give you a number of verses to study, and I want you to look for the things that Hezekiah or his people did to fight back against the Assyrians. What gave them strength? Here are the references. 
And once they find these things, I invite my students to come forward and write these things on the board. And inside my ammo box, I have some items and pictures that I pull out as my students identify things. And if they identify something that I don't have an item for, it's all right. Just allow them to write that up on the board. But what do you see? In 18.5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Faith was a part of his ammo. So out of my box, I'll pull a little plant. One of my favorite symbols for faith. Faith is like a little seed that, if nourished, will grow into a beautiful and fruitful tree of testimony. Faith is a powerful weapon against evil. We don't just rely on what we can see with our own two eyes. But we believe in things that we can feel in our hearts and are inspired by in our minds. In 18.6, he claved to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments. What's the weapon there? Obedience. A commitment or cleaving to obedience is a powerful weapon against evil. At this point, I like to pull a CTR ring out of the ammo box. When we make covenants or promises to choose the right and observe the Lord's commandments and counsels, we make ourselves strong in the face of the enemy. 1836. The people held their peace and answered him not a word. Ignoring the taunts of the adversary can be a great tactic in our fight against Satan. And out of my ammo box, I might pull a picture of someone with their hands over their ears. Remember that you don't have to engage with every argument or attack that you encounter. Sometimes the best tactic is to just ignore them. Hold your peace. You don't have to engage with every doubt or temptation or question that the adversary throws at you. Stay away from those people, places, and things that seek to tear down your faith. You don't have to listen to them. You don't have to respond. In 19.1, Hezekiah went into the house of the Lord. Well, what's one of the best places you can go for strength in challenging times? The temple. The temple is a house of refuge, protection. And I'll pull a temple recommend out of the box or a picture of a temple. Frequent temple attendance and worship can really help us to stay strong in the face of opposition and temptation. Do you remember what Hezekiah did at the beginning of the chapter? He reestablished the temple as the center of worship for his people. He makes it the center of their lives, gets rid of the high places, gets rid of the idols. The temple becomes the focal point of their faith. If we do the same, we too are going to be stronger. In 19.5, they go and they consult with Isaiah. And Isaiah was the prophet. They went to the prophet for counsel. And I suggest we do the same. Trust in and rely on the teachings and leadership of the living prophets. And at that point, I'll pull out a picture of the current president of the church or the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We will find strength in hearkening and relying on the counsels and teachings of the living prophets. 1915. Prayer can help us. Pull out a picture of somebody praying or or hands in the prayer pose. God can help us if we reach out to him. Prayer will give us power. Ask and ye shall receive. And Hezekiah's prayer here is definitely worth reviewing. 14 to 19. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. And said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear, 
and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Mm, the beautiful prayer, beautiful plea. You really get a sense of Hezekiah's faith in those verses, don't you? Now, one more set of verses that don't come from Second Kings that I'd like you to take a look at here. You'll see in the footnotes on page 536 that a cross-reference sends you to Second Chronicles chapter 32. Now, the books of Chronicles are really a repeat of the events of First and Second Kings, but with some different details. In Second Chronicles 32, verses 6 through 8, offer us this fantastic description of what Hezekiah goes out and says to his people. And he set captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. <laughs> Sounds like that, that story of Elisha from last week. I'm sure he's thinking of that story when he says that. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now, isn't that a great description of the power of faith? They would rest themselves on the comfortable words of their leaders. Well, I love Hezekiah as a Bible character. He was such a great man. Well, let's take a moment again and seek to liken the scriptures here. Have you ever used any of this ammo successfully in your battles with the world, with temptation, with the adversary? How has one of these things helped you to stand strong and not surrender? And another question, what other items do you have in your ammo box that have helped you? For me, I'd probably pull out the scriptures and my patriarchal blessing as well. Well, what's the rest of the story then? It's all fine and good to have faith and listen to the prophet, but there's still the reality of that Assyrian army out there. What's going to happen? And this is so cool. Look what happens to Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. First, 18.7. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. Then 19.20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. So Isaiah reassures Hezekiah that God hears him. In 1925, Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. The Lord reassures them that he has heard his servants in the past and blessed them in their battles. I helped them and they conquered. And what I did for them, I can do for you too. That's one of the reasons I think the Lord gave us the scriptures. They're there to show us what God has done for others and to implicitly suggest that he'll do the same things for us. And then, this is so great, the Lord makes Hezekiah a promise in verses 32 through 34. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, that's one heck of a promise. I will defend this city. Don't worry, Hezekiah. They won't even shoot an arrow at you. When I was growing up, prominently displayed on a bookcase in our home was this greenish-looking ancient arrowhead. My dad found it at an antique shop in Jerusalem in one of his travels there. Curious about it, he asked the shopkeeper about its origin. It's Assyrian, he answered, 2,700 years old. But it wasn't found here in Jerusalem. Now, now we know why, right? God promised Hezekiah that the Assyrians would not even shoot an arrow at Jerusalem. My dad bought that arrowhead as a reminder of the promise of God's protection over those who stand strong and refuse to surrender to the influence of the world. Well, what happened to those Assyrians then? Verse 35, And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning... Behold, they were all dead corpses. I find it kind of funny of how that's worded there. Basically, they woke up dead the next morning. God fought their battles for them. The Assyrians never do attack Jerusalem. Now, here's the truth of this story. If I trust in the Lord's ammunition, obedience, temples, prophets, prayer, etc., then the Lord will help me and I will win my battles. God will say the same kind of thing that he said to Hezekiah. I will defend this soul. I will defend this faith, this testimony this church, to save it for mine own sake. Satan will not even shoot an arrow there. I will protect my people as long as they rely on me. So let's go back to the map. Does this mean more to you now? That little circle around Jerusalem speaks volumes, doesn't it? Do you see why it's such a powerful map to look at? What's the message of the map? It doesn't matter how powerful the enemy looks, how many others he's conquered, how forceful his words are, how great his arguments. If we stay true to our faith, we'll stand firm and not be overcome. So I hope that the name Hezekiah becomes more of a household name in the church after this Come Follow Me lesson. Let's not forget the great lesson that his life and his example holds for us. Now, there's another little story about Hezekiah in chapter 20 that I just want to mention really briefly here. Hezekiah gets sick, and Isaiah shows up and gives him a really encouraging message. He says, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Well, then that sounds pretty final there. And it's a prophet speaking, and Isaiah no less. But Hezekiah doesn't just leave it at that. Look what he does. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. 
And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Isn't that fascinating? Now, I'm not comfortable in making any definitive doctrinal statement on the message of that story. But it could be that this is teaching us that prayer, sincere prayer, is powerful enough to even change the Lord's mind or or his plan for us? Could that be a principle here? His faith was such that God was willing to extend his life. Maybe. Or was this a trial of faith for Hezekiah? And the Lord just wanted to see if he would have the faith to pray for help. I don't know. But regardless, this story teaches the power of personal prayer. The Lord can do great things for us, give us great blessings, when we have the faith to ask for his help and his intervention. There's another interesting little facet of this story, and it's what the Lord shows Hezekiah as a sign that he'll be healed. Do you remember the story of Gideon and the principle of fleeces? But here's another example of the Lord giving a reassurance to a person of faith. So the Lord gives Hezekiah a choice. He instructs him to go out to a sundial and observe the shadow. And God says, Hezekiah, which would you like me to do for you? Move the shadow forward 10 degrees or backwards 10 degrees, you choose. And Hezekiah says, hmm, it's kind of a bigger deal for the shadow to move backwards than forwards. I guess I'll choose that. And so he looks at the sundial, and the shadow just inches back 10 degrees. And then it goes right back forward again. Now what I love about that is that nobody but Hezekiah was going to notice that miracle. I mean, it is a big deal, moving the sun for him. But just 10 degrees. This was a powerful and personal miracle and message just for Hezekiah. And I believe that the Lord can answer prayers like this for us too. He can answer with personal little miracles and messages that can help to bolster our faith and fill us with reassurances. So a discussion question that you might ask your class after looking at this story, has God ever given you a sundial experience, a fleece, a personal answer, or a minor miracle just for you? Please share. Now, there is another great king of Judah that I hope that we'll all recognize and know their name after this week, and that is King Josiah. Like Hezekiah, he too grew up under the influence of a wicked father and grandfather who reverted the children of Israel back to idol worship, even after the righteous reign of Hezekiah. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 21. It's really sad to see how quickly the people could fall back into their wicked ways and return like a dog to its vomit, as the proverb goes. Bad leaders can lead to bad nations. But Josiah is different. And it's important to keep something in mind before we go too deeply into his story. The wicked kings Manasseh and Ammon all but destroy the worship and memory of Jehovah among the people. The law of Moses, the scriptures, temple worship, all are basically eradicated under their reigns. So when Josiah comes to power, 
He doesn't even really know the right way to worship God. All of that has been lost. So for an icebreaker, I would direct your attention to a little seminary film that the church produced a number of years ago. It does an excellent job of helping your students understand the major message of Josiah's life. I'll provide you with a link to watch this video above and in the description below. It's called Josiah and the Book of the Law. And to help your students get more out of the film, you could give them this secret phrase activity as a handout and have them fill it in as they watch the film and study the scriptures. Part of the answers come from the film and part come from the scriptures themselves. And the secret phrase at the bottom contains a great truth that I feel this story teaches us. So first, the questions from the movie. Before Josiah was king, his fathers had built blanks for Baal and Molech where child sacrifices were performed. They had built altars. After Josiah was made king, he decided to repair the blank. The temple. Even though Josiah sought to restore the true worship of Jehovah again, he feared he wouldn't be able to change the blanks of the people and turn them away from their idols. He feared that he wouldn't be able to change the hearts of the people. While working on the temple, the blank of the law was found. The book of the law was found. After hearing the words of the Lord that had been found, Josiah feared the blank of the Lord would be kindled against the people for their years of disobedience. The wrath of the Lord. The king decided to blank the words of the book of the law in the ears of all the people. He decided to read the words of the scriptures. After hearing Josiah, the people made a blank to turn to the Lord. A covenant to turn to the Lord. And during a battle with the Egyptians, King Josiah was struck by archers and later blank. Sadly, he later died. Now, I hate to just have my students watch a movie without engaging them with the actual scriptures themselves. So after the movie, I instruct them to find a few more answers from the scriptures that will help guide them to a few of the more significant verses from the story, which they could mark if you encourage them. So in 2 Kings 22, 19-20, we hear the Lord promise Josiah great blessings because he had blank himself before the Lord. He had humbled himself before the Lord. After hearing the words of the book of the law, the people made a covenant to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with blank their heart and soul. From 2 Kings 23.3, with all their heart and soul. 2 Kings 23.4-20 describes all of King Josiah's efforts to destroy the practice of blank out of the kingdom. Idolatry. 2 Kings 23.25 gives Josiah a great tribute. Apparently, Josiah is considered to be the blank king of all the kings of Judah. Now, this one's a little bit tougher because it... The word doesn't actually appear in the scriptures. But the sentiment of that verse is that Josiah is considered to be the greatest king of all the kings of Judah. There was no king like him before and no king after. Well, what's the secret phrase then? The scriptures have the power to change lives. That's what happens in this story, isn't it? It was the scriptures that had the power to change the people. It wasn't until the scriptures were read to them that they were able to leave behind their former lives 
and evil practices. The scriptures changed them. And King Josiah also deserves part of the credit as he was the one who was willing to teach the people the scriptures and led them by example and invitation to commit themselves to make a covenant to live according to the laws of God. The scriptures in the hands of great teachers and leaders can make a huge difference in people's lives. And now, you're going to have your students share their response to the final question that's there on the handout. It's a personal question. What evidence have you seen in your life that this statement is true? Well, you don't have to work too hard to convince me of this principle. I know that it's true. I've seen it with my own eyes over and over again. The scriptures have power. If people will just value them and open them and study them and apply them, I can promise them that they're going to have a profound and life-changing impact. I know they have for me. I love the scriptures. I've been teaching from their pages almost daily now for the past 23 years. And you know what? I'm not tired of them yet. I'm nowhere near that point, And quite honestly, I don't think I'm ever going to get tired of them. Now, I know you've heard me share this before. But I don't mind repeating that I believe the scriptures to be more relevant than any newspaper or magazine, more fascinating than any Harry Potter or Tom Clancy novel, more practical than any self-help book, and more instructive and educational than any textbook. And it seems that the Jewish people really learned something from their greatest king. I believe that every religion has something to teach us. And we could all afford to have a little more holy envy for the strengths demonstrated by other faiths. One of the things that I admire most about the Jewish people is their incredible love and respect for the scriptures. If you go to a synagogue or to Israel or to the Western Wall, you may get a chance to see the way the rabbis read from the scriptures. They carefully remove the Torah scrolls from their cases, then walk slowly and solemnly with them, cradling them in their arms like a child. Then they gently unroll and read from them with great reverence and respect on their lips. There's so much affection for the word of God. There's even a special ceremony and a kind of a funeral when, when a Torah is considered to be too old and needs to be retired. They take the Torah and they bury it almost as if it were a person. Does our love of the scriptures compare with their respect and their love for the Torah? And we've got so much more. We've got the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, I feel that we would do well to learn from their example and develop just as strong a deep and abiding love for the Word of God. I'd like to conclude with my favorite thing that Joseph Smith ever said about the Scriptures. He said, He who reads them oftenest will like them best. If we take the time to study and value the Word of God, will develop a love for his word that can last a lifetime. Both Joseph Smith and Josiah understood that. And that's our lesson for this week, my friends. Thank you for taking the time to listen and study the scriptures with me this week. If any of you are interested in the resources that I put together for teachers, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to all of those things. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.